Hi, I'm Patrick Scott, and welcome back to PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. In the next few sessions, we're going to be talking about public policy and public policy making. We'll be covering things like stages of the policy process, different models of policy making, how policies are made, and then we'll also get into some substantive areas such as economic policy, uh, social welfare policy, and foreign and defense policy. Now this is a good time to talk about this because we've been talking so up to this point about different institutions. So we've, we've covered, for example, Congress and the presidency and bureaucracy. <clears throat> and if you look at the, think about this, what these institutions do, the output of these institutions is public policy. Now let's begin, first of all, by talking about, you know, giving you a definition of public policy. What is public policy? And a good working definition of public policy is simply actions that are taken by government officials in response to problems and issues that are raised by various actors throughout our political system. And as I was, I was alluding to in terms of public policy, each branch or different institutions make public policy. How does Congress make policy? Through the laws, of course, that it passes. How about the president? What's a good way in which the president makes policy? Well, through shaping his agenda, his uh, policy agenda, his legislative agenda, his agenda of what he wants to get done through the bureaucracy, and also through the write, writing and signing of executive orders, as we've talked about before. We haven't really talked about the judiciary at this point, but the judiciary makes policy. Our court system makes policy. And how is, how is that manifested in our court system? Through various decisions, uh, that court decisions that are rendered. Um, and certainly the bureaucracy makes policy in terms of how it interprets the law and how it implements the law through the process of implement and issuing uh, rules and regulations. So all the different branches and actors in our political system play a key role in terms of making public policy. A lot of what government is all about is involved in policy making. Now when you're looking at policies and, 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 and how policies are made, a lot of scholars have, have examined this issue and they have identified typically uh, various stages of the policy making process. And, and policies don't necessarily go through each stage in the same sequential order, but these are some, they, they try to highlight in the research some of the basic elements that come into play um, as part of that process. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about some of the various stages in the policy making process. How does an idea, that is, get translated into some kind of tangible action such as a law or a rule or regulation? Well, scholars have identified one of the first stages of the policy process is this idea of issue identification. What happens here is that some event may occur in our society. Uh, there may be some tragic event. Um, somebody comes in and, and um, into a post office and opens fire with a, with a machine gun or people begin, you know, and that happens, people begin to call for uh, government to start passing strict gun control legislation. Or you may have, for example, a group that calls attention to an issue, such as the need for uh, in funding for uh, cervical cancer research or AIDS, uh, funding for AIDS uh, research, or uh, somehow we, we, we need to, to do something about the deficit and we need to t attack the deficit. But basically an issue is out there and people are calling upon um, the government to address this issue. So that's the idea of issue identification. There's an issue out there and people are taking notice of this issue and they're beginning to press upon government to deal with this issue. Now, scholars will say that this idea or this issue has entered the next stage and that is agenda setting when this uh, issue begins to get attention from government decision makers. So you can say that an issue gets on the agenda when government, government officials begin to give serious, the problem or the issue, serious attention. Um, and the way you can see in what, uh, how an idea has gotten on to the agenda setting stage, some indicators that an issue has made it to the stage. If, for example, the president calls for a commission or a task force to study an issue. If, for example, Congress decides to hold hearings on a particular matter. Uh, those are just some simple examples of how you can say an issue has sort of gotten on the policy agenda. Um, but in any case, issue identification and agenda setting are the first two stages of the policy process. And in, the, in a lot of ways, this is where the media, by the way, can play a key role 
because when the media decides to report on a particular issue and highlight the importance of this issue, it begins to get the attention of citizens and then citizens in turn begin to urge members of Congress or the President, government officials to give attention to this issue, somehow to address this problem that we see. Now, the next stage is something known as a policy formulation process. And simplistically, it's the idea that when is, is, uh, policy formulation is when officials are trying to develop solutions to address the problem or the issue that is on the policy agenda. Um, it's a much more complicated process than what I just suggested here, though. All right? Many people may in, be involved in the development of this process. There may be actors inside of government and those outside of government, such as in interest groups and, and others, uh, neighborhood groups, and people who are banding together who are, who are saying we need to figure out how do we solve this problem. And it may be a, a combination of government officials working with people in the private sector to, to try to craft solutions to whatever problem is that they're dealing with. Um, this again can be a very difficult process though because one of the first things you do is you try to develop various kinds, you consider various solutions to the problem. Now some problems in our society are very, very difficult and, and one of the things that government tries to do is deal with very complex issues uh, such as homelessness. How do you solve the problem of homelessness? If homelessness were that easy of a problem, it would have already been solved. How do you solve the problem of crime in our society or drugs in our society? How do you solve the problem of, for example, uh, teenage pregnancies? And so the point here is that these can be very, very difficult problems that require a lot of time and effort spent in terms of trying to solve these. Um, in the process of formulating solutions to a given problem, we're looking at different kinds of alternatives. We have different alternatives that may be on the table. And how do we know, for example, which alternative to choose? Which among these are the best? Well, for each alternative you may try to identify in terms of trying to solve a given problem, you need to develop the benefits and the costs associated with each kind of issue. Um, so again, if you look at the, the problem of homelessness, you know, how do you solve the problem of homelessness? At what level of government should you solve it? What kinds of programs should you develop or craft to, to, to deal with the problems of homelessness? And at the same time, you recognize that homelessness is such a pervasive problem because it involves so many other things too. Uh, why are people homelessness? What, homeless? What causes homelessness? Um, is it simply the economy? Do you need to address this through economic incentives and, and tax incentives and enterprise zones to create jobs? Is it more um, fundamental to the, some of the individuals who are homeless that may have some types of addiction? So do you need some kind of drug treatment or psychological intervention? Um, so, so as you can see, that it's a, it can be a very complicated uh, a problem. Where do you solve the problem? Do you solve the problem in terms of the local level or the federal level? Uh, it, should you provide most of your emphasis on overnight shelters? Um, what about in terms of uh, job training and, and, and retraining for, to help people develop skills to be able to find employment? So again, all of these things seem, seem to suggest different alternatives and different programs and, and funding levels associated with it. How do you choose among the myriad of alternatives? Uh, and then again, that's what makes it so complicated of a process because for each of these alternatives, we have to think about what are the benefits of a particular alternative, what are the cost, short-term and long-term costs associated with these alternatives. And we also think about not only in terms of, of, of benefits and costs, but also political feasibility. Uh, is it feasible or is it acceptable politically to move in one direction or another direction? So in the process of formulating solutions, government may have to, re may, may rely upon the views of those who have had a lot of experience with the problem. Uh, Congress may commission a set of studies to examine, again, the costs and the benefits of each of these alternatives. Um, people who work as, uh, in bureaucracy, uh, they may engage in a study to try to, for example, count the number of homeless people in America today or to see what the trend has been in the past 10 years or so. Um, and, but through this process, hopefully, maybe one or two sets of solutions uh, will emerge as possibilities. And again, there will be maybe a lot of bargaining, a lot of compromise, a lot of negotiation to make sure that the solutions that we craft are acceptable to all of the people or the groups who have a major stake in the issue. So I want you to understand uh, policy formulation stage is probably one of the most difficult ones because you're really trying to craft alternatives and, and examine the feasibility of each of these alternatives to find out what works, what works best, and perhaps what doesn't work. Um, 
But once that stage has been uh, completed, and again, this may be a long-term process, uh, but once we have identified a set of alternatives and we've decided upon a given alternative or a given set of alternatives, then you can say that the policy is now going through the policy adoption stage. All right, the policy has now been, uh, we're, we're now, the government is now saying, this is the direction we're going to move into, and we're going to adopt these policies. And again, this is the process that also may involve a lot of bargaining and compromise, and it may also take a long time for the policy. It's not simply we're adopting it overnight and that's it. Uh, for example, if you look at air pollution, um, national air pollution laws uh, were passed, for example, some fundamental laws were passed in 1960, um, but the Environmental Protection Agency, as an example, was not created until 1970, and uh, important amendments to the Clean Air Act was passed in 1990. And so these are examples here over a 20-year period where a policy was going through the policy adoption stage in various forms. But once the policy is adopted, or as it is being adopted, it, it begins to go through something called the policy implementation stage. And this is, of course, the case where a policy is often carried out by bureaucratic agencies, federal department and agencies, but also state and local departments and agencies as well. As we've talked about before, Congress will pass a law and the bureaucracy will be responsible for translating the vague mandate, such as clean air, into tangible policies in terms of tangible rules and regulations that specifically are formulated to deal with the uh, technical uh, complexities that are involved in terms of what creates and constitutes air pollution, how, how best you solve it. Um, but the bureaucracy, again, the Congress passes the headache onto the bureaucracy, and the bureaucracy is given the resources and the expertise and the money and the authority and the discretion to figure out what to do. Now, the President, as part of this, may also issue an executive order and charge the bureaucracy with the task of implementing that order. And again, the bureaucracy is trying to formulate that order in a way that, it, that the bureaucracy thinks is feasible. Now, as you might imagine, because of that, the policy can change quite dramatically during this stage. You know, in fact, policies are often implemented that are quite different from what Congress or the President may have even intended, okay? And that's because sometimes neither Congress nor the President are really sure about how best to implement a certain policy. So, it often gives the bureaucracy a lot of latitude for deciding how this policy should be implemented, all right? So, therefore, the policy implemented may be very different from the policy envisioned by the Congress or the President or even the people. And that can, that can easily happen. And, um, and the outcome of that depends upon a lot of factors. Now, another way besides the uh, bureaucracy implementing a policy different from the way it was intended, another way it can be implemented quite differently is through what the states do. So state enforcement, state discretion, or the state resources, if this is a policy that requires state involvement, you may see that policy implemented quite differently from state to state. Some states may actually uh, implement this policy in a very strict kind of fashion that really follows presidential and or congressional intentions. Other states may not have the resources to do so or may choose not to follow it uh, as the way the President or Congress, or even, we should also bring up the courts as another example of that, the way the courts intended. And again, a good example of that, if we look, talk about the courts, would be how Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, they instituted desegregation in the schools, how different states implemented that policy quite differently, and how the South, as a regional uh, group of you know, uh, states, chose not to implement Brown versus Board of Education with all deliberate speed as mandated by the court. But for years, this, this many southern states, the school districts in many southern states were dragging their feet in terms of instituting school desegregation. But again, how the policy is carried out depends, therefore, not only in terms of what the bureaucracy does with it, but also maybe what the states decide to do. Okay, again, remember from the Reserve Powers Clause of the Constitution, the Tenth Amendment, uh, the states have a lot of flexibility in terms of, of power and they may again have a lot of leeway uh, and may exercise a lot of leeway in terms of how they implement a policy. So that's a part, that's a process of policy implementation and it can again change quite it, dramatically, it may take a long time to do and the outcome may look a lot different from the way it was originally intended. Now the last stage of this uh, the policy making process is something known as the policy evaluation stage. And the, basically the question asked at this time is how well did the policy work 
And, you know, did we get our, the right bang for the buck? Did we get a, a, a good return on our investment of taxpayer dollars for this policy? How should we change this, you know? Should, are, were there in the process of implementing the policy some unintended side effects? For years, a lot of people criticized um, uh, our longstanding welfare policy embodied in some, a program called AFDC, with Aid to Families with Dependent Children, because a lot of people believe that um, the problem with AFDC in terms of welfare was that it had some perverse incentives built into it that contributed to uh, the breakup of the family. Because if you have uh, two parents living in the same household, the repayments would be reduced. And so because of that, there was an incentive for people not to be living, to both parents to living in the same household because uh, the recipients would get more money in, the, in that process. And so again, are these, could, this could be looked at as, as potentially an unintended side effect of, of, uh, of our prior welfare policy. And that was changed actually in 1996, and we'll be talking about that later. Uh, with the implementation of something called TANF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. But the point here is the policy evaluation stage tries to identify how well the program worked. Did the money go to the recipients that it was intended to? And then, or did the programs really help the recipients it was in intended to help? And then how well did it help those recipients? What was the outcome? Did the recipients of this program find jobs or not? Uh, did it lead to a better uh, situation in their quality of life or, or, or health or whatever the program may be? And again, this process can be a very complicated process because you may be looking at trends over time and it's hard to disentangle the effects of the program from other kinds of things that are going on. And I'll just give you a quick example of that. So here's an example of how we might say, see uh, you know, unintended side effects or trying to figure out how well a policy worked. Let's say, for example, that a state decided the state legislator, legislature decided to pass a law that um, mandated that people um, have helmets when they're riding um, their motorcycles. And what they're trying to find out is to what extent did this change in the policy lead to a reduction in motorcycle related fatalities and particularly head injuries over time. And you may have all kinds of factors that may come into play that may influence that, such as the time of the year, the season, uh, the number of motorcycles, the number of miles you know, uh, traveled, um, and, so, and, and to what extent it may have been a function of alcohol involved or other kinds of things. So, so in other words, it may be very, very difficult to figure out how effective was the policy itself. Did the policy actually achieve a reduction in these kinds of specific traffic-related fatalities or was the, maybe if you saw a reduction, was it related to other kinds of factors that are going on? And this is just a simple example of how complex it may be to try to figure out if a policy or program is working, especially when you try to disentangle the impact of the program or policy from other factors that are out there that may have also had some impact on the outcomes you're trying to achieve. All right, so again, the policy evaluation process may sound simple, we're trying to figure out did the policy work, but the actual process involved in trying to figure out if it worked can be very, very complex. All right, but anyway, in any case, those are the different stages of the policy making process. And again, <clears throat> it's not like, it's not necessarily each stage goes through exactly each phase, but these are the, the, the research on that, and, and that uh, researchers have studied on policy making have identified these as being the most prominent elements. And by the way, in terms of policy evaluation, what you may find too is that the information, hopefully the information that we find from the policy evaluation stage, we don't just simply leave the results there and put them on the shelf or something, but instead hopefully the information from the policy evaluation stage will feed back into the policy formulation stage. What we found in the policy evaluation stage in terms of what aspects of the program works best, what aspects work uh, the least, which ones are the most expensive, which ones are the most cost effective. Hopefully we can take that information and feed that back into the policy formulation so that we can continually, on an ongoing basis, craft better solutions to dealing with some of the problems that we have here at hand. Now, again, those are the different stages of the policy making process. Now I'm gonna move, in, move on and talk about different models of policy making. All right, now the models of policy making, the way I look at it, if you think about what models are, Models are depictions of reality. Think of models as a lens through which you can view something going on, and it tends to highlight a particular aspect, all right, of, of that particular phenomenon. 
Um, so we're going to be talking about different models of policy making, and I want you to keep in mind too that uh, no one is superior, but each one can be useful in terms of highlighting what is going on. And you can take any policy area, such as health policy, and apply health policy, or any other policy for that matter, and put it under, under these four different microscopes, if you will, that highlight different, different aspects of, of what's going on. Now, four basic models of policy making are known as the rational model, the incremental model, the pluralist model, and the elitist model. And again, all the models are useful. No one is necessarily superior to the others. But I think for some policies, one model might do a better job than others in explaining what's happening. Um, and then at other times, another model may be a better way to explain what's going on, all right? Um, but in, in, and again, I want you to understand that the models uh, should not be confused with the stages in the policymaking process. We talk about policy formulation, implementation, evaluation. Those are stages, and what we're going to be talking about now are models. All right, so the first model is something known as the rational model. The rational model is very much like the process of the scientific method that you probably studied about back in school a few years ago. It's very much the idea of systematically trying to study and, and understand a particular phenomenon. And you see the rational model particularly at play when you're looking at policy formulation, trying to craft solutions to policies. And the idea behind it is this. After you have identified a problem, you're going to gather information to find out what are the root causes of the problem. So for example, what's the root cause of crime? Why do people cr engage in criminal behavior? Is it because people come from bad backgrounds, from broken homes? Um, is it it's despondency over being poor? You know, so, so you try to figure out what are some of the root problems uh, or causes of the problem. Now, <clears throat> as with the policy formulation stage, you're going to be trying to formulate and craft alternative solutions. You're going to be evaluating the feasibility of each alternative in terms of cost and benefits. Uh, you want to assess the probability of success of each alternative. How likely, if we, invent, if, if we create or craft or implement this solution, how likely is it, li is it going to be an effective solution? So you're trying to, in a you know, sort of a futuristic kind of way, trying to figure out what is a likely probability of success. And that can be a very difficult thing to do. Um, but from that process, from that research process, and studying the issues and the causes and trying to craft alternative solutions, you're trying to come up with the best alternative. And, um, and then as part of that, you're trying to also do a preliminary evaluation of its success. Now, that's, again, the idea is very much like the, you know, the scientific methods. You're engaging in hypotheses. You're trying to craft a way to test your hypothesis, coming up with propositions, figuring out a way to look at different alternatives, the cost and the benefits of the alternatives in a very systematic and analytical fashion and th from that process trying to identify what might be the best solution or the most optimal solution. Now, this model can be very useful because this approach encourages decision makers to really think through a problem uh, and to apply your expertise and your training to identify the best solutions. And it can be a very systematic scientific process that can be very complex, technical, and detailed in nature. But as useful as that approach might be, the model, the rational model, is not always suitable to the actual nature of governmental decision making. Now think about this. Why might it be hard to implement or employ a ra the rational model as you're trying to make policy? It sounds like a very good way of doing it. You know, systematic scientific study of the issue, you craft optimal solutions, you implement the optimal solution, you get the best bang for the buck. Well, often, first of all, it's hard to agree upon what the problem really is. I mean, for example, if you talk about pollution, is the real problem air pollution? Is it water pollution? Is it trash? You know, you know what, what is the real problem here? And it's not only hard to agree on what the problem is, but it's also very difficult to agree on how to solve the problem. Oftentimes, some of the problems that we have here are existing because they exceed our analytical abilities to comprehend all the different possibilities and all the different solutions. Um, if we agree that the real problem, for example, is air pollution, you know, what is the best way to solve air pollution? Should we focus by attacking auto emissions, you know, by reducing auto emissions? Is that the real problem here? 
Uh, maybe the real problem is that we need to curtail industrial emissions. Maybe that's the, the, the most significant problem of air pollution that affects long term our health. Uh, maybe what we really need to focus on instead, we need to curtail uh, CFCs, chloro chlorofluorocarbons in the atmosphere uh, that we see in, for example, in terms of refrigerants and others, uh, or propellants and spray kins, because those are the ones that lead to, to the depletion of the ozone and therefore contribute to uh, skin cancer rates. So the point here is trying to figure out what is the, the problem to begin with. And in many cases, there are simply too many limits to what we know. If we, if we, we only have limited resources here, what is the best way to allocate those resources <clears throat> in a way that most importantly addresses the problem? Um, also, I think another issue pertaining to this is the limitation of the rational model is that the rational model tends to elevate the norms of science over all other considerations. And while that may be good to take a scientific and technical approach to studying the issue, um, science does not always lead the way. I mean, I think the problem here is that when you elevate the norms of science, you tend to uh, relegate, uh, de-emphasize other important uh, values such as political considerations and political feasibility. There might be an optimal scientific solution out there, but it may not be politically feasible to do this. And I'll give you just a quick example. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services several years looked at, at, at ways to uh, different programs that were designed to reduce uh, the number of deaths in our country. And they crafted a lot of different kinds of solutions. <clears throat> and one of them, I think the optimal solution and solutions that they had in their list was advertising for seat belts. If we have more campaign advertisements, if we have more public advertisements for seat belt, encouraging people to use their seat belts, that that was going to lead to a lot of bang for the buck. I think it was, I forgot the specific dollars, but you know, just simply, you know, just a couple hundred dollars for every life saved. So it's very, very cheap. And way down the list, <coughs> excuse me, lay, way down the list was um, um, cervical cancer research. Um, because cervical cancer is such a difficult, or oh no, ovarian cancer as well, uh, because uh, it's, 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 it's oftentimes people don't know they have these kinds of cancers until um, it's in advanced stages. It's very very hard to uh, to you know overcome uh, th th this problem, and the amount of money and research going into into this, uh, analysts in the Department of Health and Human Services estimated that it would cost something like you know, $12,000 per life saved um, in order to, so funding in, in terms of life saved was much more expensive in terms of our research and programs uh, for, for uh, ovarian and cervical cancer as opposed to seatbelt usage. Well, if you were a rational policy maker, you'd say, okay, let's take the ones that give you the best bang for the buck and the ones that give you the best bang for the buck, a couple hundred dollars per life saved, for example, you can save a lot more lives with that money than you can in terms of research in terms of cervical or ovarian cancer. And the argument here is this. <clears throat> if we use this purely rational model or approach to uh, preventing the number of deaths in our country, and we've simply focused on what the analyst has said as which ones provide the best bang for the buck in terms of how we allocate tax dollars, then probably research for ovarian and cervical cancer would fall off that list. Now the question is, would that fly? Would that be a good idea? Would that be a politically acceptable solution? And the answer is clearly no. And there would be, in a situation like that, probably many different groups in our society, many women's groups for example, that would come out very strongly in opposition to a government decision to curtail or cut back or eliminate funding for ovarian and cervical cancer research just because some analyst in the bureaucracy applying the rational model decided it wasn't an optimal way to allocate tax dollars, you see. So again, that's an example of how the rational model tends to elevate science and technical considerations over uh, other considerations such as political considerations. And that's why sometimes the rational model is not a feasible model to use. It can be a good model in that it brings, forces discipline on the process in terms of studying the process, but in terms of actually using it sometimes, again, it, it, it doesn't always, it's not always suitable for government decision making. Okay, now, <clears throat> that's the rational model. Let's talk about another model here, and um, 
this is a very, very different kind of model, and this is something known as the incremental model. The idea behind the incremental model is that policy making can be so complex that we end up proceeding on an incremental basis. Okay, that is, we make policy one small step at a time. <clears throat> we basically take what we have and move in small steps. Unlike the rational model, we're not focusing on all possible alternatives and outcomes, but we're only looking at a few, we're limited, our, our search is very much limited to what we're doing right now. We're focusing only on a few alternatives at most. Once we decide on a particular course of action, we're going to continue along that path in small steps. All right? So we're saying this is what we've adopted, this is where we're going. Do we have success from what we can uh, ascertain at this point? If we do, we're going to continue along that path. So basically, in this kind of way, policy making is, does not move in leaps and bounds. Policy making does not go back to the drawing board every few years and we re, you know, reinvent the wheel. But instead, we take what we've got, we take what we've been doing, and we simply incrementally change it to a small degree one way or the other. And if we happen to move in the wrong direction, there will be some interest groups or people that are out there that, that are going to generate noise that will tell us, no, this is not the right way to go, and then we'll shift and adjust accordingly. But we're basically making changes at the margins. All right? We're not fundamentally reinventing the wheel and saying we're going to completely wipe this out and go to a whole different direction. What we're simply doing is making marginal incremental change in our policy making. Now what this basically means is that there may be a lot of other good policies that are out there, but they're going to get ignored because they were not considered in the initial set of decisions to proceed along a certain path. So good alternative policies might not even be considered, might not even be considered. And that's just one of the consequences of the incremental model. So policy making according to this model simply proceeds in small steps. It does not move in leaps and bounds. And interestingly, our democratic system is, 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 give, is geared toward incremental limited change. Um, pass, and the reason why I say that, if we look at our budgets, um, our last year's budget, if we look at this year's and next year's budget, you're going to find, you know, think about budgets as uh, reflections of policies. All right? Now, often what happens through the process of, bud of budgetary decision making the budgets that are crafted from one fiscal year to the next reflect oftentimes, more often than not, minor incremental changes from the prior year's budget. Now if you think about dollars being spent on programs is a reflection of policy decisions. All right? And so because of that, if you think about this in terms of our budgetary process, the fact that our budgetary process is a very incremental process from year to year, you know, we're going to add a little bit of dollars to this program, we're going to take away some dollars to this program. But we're not fundamentally reinventing the wheel from year to year, you know, from one year to the next. That is the nature of budgetary decision making. And because that's the way budget decisions are made, if you think about dis budgetary decisions as a reflection of policies, then that's the way policies are made. And policies are, again, incremental in nature. And again, if you think about this and why this might be a, a useful model to consider, past steps that we've taken give insights into future courses of action we learn as we go along. You can make better predictions of future steps in this fashion and if you, again, if you commit an error or go the wrong way, you can adjust and get back on the path quite easily, quite rapidly. And again, so this provides for a much better form of error correction than, than say, the rational approach. All right? Like I said, we don't reinvent the wheel every time we make policy. Um, so again, those is, that's how essentially the incremental model works. Now, a related model to that is something called the pluralist model. And the pluralist model basically suggests this. It says essentially because our goals are ambiguous and because they are inconsistent and because people's priorities differ, what happens is that people need to come together and bargain about which problems and, uh, need to be solved and build coalitions around those particular uh, problems. Which ones are we going to focus on? So the idea behind the pluralist model is that public policies reflect bargains and compromises made. The idea of the pluralist model we've talked about before, if you think about government as being a broker of a lot of different kinds of competing interests, it's trying to accommodate a, a variety of interests, and some of which are contradictory in nature. And because of that, some policies that we make uh, really reflect some of those contradictions. Well, 
In this case here, public policies are reflecting bargains and compromises made. Many groups that are out there may play a role in the policy making process and the policies that end up getting made reflect the input of all of these players. So the solution that we adopt may not be the best solution, but it's one that is acceptable to all parties concerned. And to give you an example in terms of environmental policy, uh, the, Clean Air, the uh, Clean Air Act of 1990, and actually it's the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990, reflects a lot of compromises. The Clean Air Act was designed to make a lot of progress in this, but, and one of the things it was designed to do is to reduce auto emissions, but it did not reduce auto emissions as much as people liked because it would have meant a major loss of automobile manufacturing jobs in Detroit. Another example, using environmental policy in the Clean Air Act, um, it did not, a lot of people feel like it did not go far enough to eliminating acid rain. What is acid rain? Acid rain is, is uh, moisture in the atmosphere that is generated by plants. Often what happens is that, that uh, uh, utility plants in the Midwest will use a certain type of coal for electricity to produce electricity. And it's a high, it has a high sulfur content. It's cheaper, but it has a high sulfur content. And as the plants use this coal in terms of powering these plants and generating the electricity, as they use this high sulfur coal, they emit sulfur into the air. And then as the uh, weather patterns move in an, in an easterly and northeasterly dile uh, direction, uh, that sulfur mixes with the clouds and the rain and turns into acid rains. And acid rain is very bad for the environment and contributes to deforestation of uh, areas in the northeast in Canada. And so people have identified acid rain as being a problem. So then the question becomes, how many tons of this sulfur should be emitted into the air each year? Uh, how much should we cut back? It's again a very complex and technical question. But it's also, by the way, a very political question. Um, because there are likely to be a lot of winners and losers depending upon how the policy is carried out. If you cut back on the amount of pollution allowed, then you end up potentially uh, wiping out uh, jobs in West Virginia, people who are engaged in coal mining. You may end up wiping out a lot of their jobs and contributing to the poverty rates in Appalachia. And poverty in Appalachia is very high as it is. On the other hand, if you don't cut back enough, you continue to harm the environment. So the Clean Air Act did not reduce acid rain as much as we would have liked to have because that would have meant the reduction, a huge loss of coal miner jobs in West Virginia. The point here in all this is that this is a good example of the pluralist model at work. The policy that was enacted was one that reflected a lot of bargaining and compromise among various people. Now again, think about this too um, in terms of how does this relate to the pluralist model. The pluralist model uh, and the incremental model, sorry. The pluralist and the incremental model go hand in hand. But think about the incremental model in terms of the processes involved, this, you know, in terms of um, incremental changes from, from one part of the policy to another, you know, moving in small changes. So th think about that in terms of process, whereas the pluralist model, think of that in, in terms of people, the people who are involved in the process, the various actors that are involved. The outcomes tend to be the same. I mean, the fact that you've got all these different people and actors weighing in on decisions means that through the give and take of policies, naturally, the policies that are made tend to be incremental in nature. They may reflect some winners and some losers here and winners and losers there over time. Um, but again, it's because of the nature of compromise, the nature of the change of the policy tends to be incremental in nature. And that's how I kind of reconcile the two ideas behind the incremental model of policy making and the the rational model of policy making. Now I'm going to show here, here a graphic, it's kind of an interesting graphic uh, that uh, has been used in a lot of, by a lot of different scholars and, um, and I think it applies in this area as well pretty nicely. If you think about the idea of goals and means to achieve these goals, all right, so we've got the, basically the idea is, you know, do we agree on what we want to do or not agree on what we want to do? And then if we did have agreement on what we want to do, do we have disagreement on how to get there or do we know how to get there? Okay, so we can take this typology and come up and, and, and describe the, these three models here. All right. Now, the idea behind the rational model is if we agree on what we want to do, okay, and we know how to do it, there is no technical uncertainty here, then when we have, in other words, agreement on ends, 
agreement on means, agreement on goals, agreement on how to achieve those goals. That's what I'm talking about here. If we have agreement on both goals and means to achieve those goals, then the rational model is probably the best model that explains how policy is made. Now what happens if we don't have agreement on goals to begin with, where we need to have people who come together, then people need to come together and bargain and negotiate and compromise on what should be, what should be the, 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 the uh, direction that we move into. Well, that would be probably a good example of where the, the pluralist model is coming into play, where we, people are engaging in coalitions, building coalitions, uh, trying to push their, their views on what we should do. This is basically a case where we're, we may not have, we may have agreement on how to get there if we could only agree on the goals to begin with. Um, then the pluralist model uh, would come into play. Um, what about if we have agreement on what we do, but we don't know how to do it? All right, this, in this case there is technical uncertainty. This is where we, don't ha we have agreement on the ends, but we don't have agreement on the means because we have technical uncertainty. We don't know how to, do it, how to solve the problem. Well, this is probably where the incremental model best applies. All right, so we, we basically engage in uh, search and error correction. So we search for solutions and we gauge in error correction as soon as we uh, find that we're moving in the wrong direction. Uh, so you can see here on this graphic then a situation where we don't have agreement on the ends but we do on, on, on the goal. We have agreement on the goals but we don't have agreement on the ends, on the means because there's technical uncertainty. Um, the last uh, quadrant I have left blank and that is where we don't have agreement on either the goals or the means to achieve those. Now some scholars have talked about that in terms of organizational decision making. They said what, what's, what applies there is something called the garbage can model of decision making uh, where uh, goals and solutions are, are, are just kind of like a, a big pot stirred around and sometimes a solution is found, sometimes a solution is not found, sometimes a solution is attached to a problem, sometimes it's not. Uh, but oftentimes, the reason why I left this blank uh, is because oftentimes if you don't have agreement on what you want to do and you don't have agreement on how to do it, then chances are you're not doing anything. You don't really have a policy there. I would actually put there, if I were to put anything there, I would probably make the argument that you should put down policy failure uh, because you don't have a policy in place, because you don't have agreement on what you want to do, and even if you did have agreement, you wouldn't know how to do it. So in this case, it would be policy failure, but I had to let, let that deliberately blank. Uh, but in any case, those are some of the basic models. Now, the last model that some texts talk about is the idea of the elitist model. I don't really put as much uh, emphasis on this, but the, this, this model, the elitist model, is the idea that policy is made by elites, all right? And you could say that iron triangles may fit this view pretty nicely. The military-industrial complex, uh, if you looked at you know, how defense policy is made, who benefits from this primarily more than anybody else? And that would be defense contractors, Halliburton, for example, Bechtel, and other uh, corporations that, that uh, benefit handsomely from these you know, multi-billion dollar contracts. Looking at health policy, why is our health policy the way it is? Who benefits from this health policy? Is it primarily the insurance industry and doctors? Is that why there's maybe resistance to changing fundamentally health care policy? Because knowing that there'd be a lot of fight uh, and resistance by health care executives and doctors as well as the insurance executives. So in looking at health policy, you might say that that would be possibly a good example of the elitist model at work because the players who are benefiting, who, uh, who are, you know, the actors who are benefiting from this policy are among those who are among the wealthiest, well-connected economically and politically in our society. So that, that would be an example of the elitist model at work. Now, when we come back during our, our next discussion, we're actually going to get into some specific policy arenas. We're gonna be talking about uh, economic policy. We're gonna be talking about the difference between monetary policy and fiscal policy. We're also going to be talking about uh, the national debt. Uh, is it a bad thing? How, how do deficits contribute to the national debt? We'll be talking about economic development policies, uh, economic regulatory policies as well. And hopefully we'll have time to even squeeze in a little bit of discussion of social welfare policy. So this is Patrick Scott. We'll see you next time.